Hello and welcome. Uh, Thank you're you. in Austin, are you? Yes. Um, so uh, your album, The Lodger, is coming out in a week or so, and I had to listen to it last night, even watch some of the film again. <laughs> it's, oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for listening <laughs> and watching. My pleasure. So uh, I guess the first question is just how did you get involved with uh, reimagining the soundtrack to a film from 1927? So, uh, you know, I do a lot of film and TV work, but the first uh, film scores, really the way I learned how to do film scores was scoring silence. Uh, you know, I was doing some, you know, experimental shorts and for people or student shorts, but it was a theater chain uh, started here in Austin, the Alamo Draft House. Uh, Tim asked me to score a silent film. And that's really, that was the first feature I scored was Battleship Potemkin. Oh, yeah. So a year later, we have a theater in town, not the LA studio Paramount, but a, a old 1800s concert hall and theater here in Austin called Paramount commissioned me to write a new uh, lodger score. You know, I've done a million silent film scores, but uh, we connected with Fire Records on this one. And so we turned this one into a full on album. Pretty cool. So w when you approach a, a film like uh, Hitchcock's Lodger, um, music wise, do you go back and listen to what had been used in the past that worked with it? Or do you try to clear the air and start fresh? I've done it both ways, partly depending on this case, I did it fresh. Uh, didn't really listen to anything. What I will do is put on other music that's not mine. Uh, just to see what works with the film. Cause I'm not trying to make period music. I'm not trying to make it sound like this is music that was created in the same year, but I do want music that finds something that meshes well, that marries down to picture well. So you're not, I don't want to pull someone into the 1980s for no good reason with an 80th synth sound that, that <laughs> But I don't want to ignore a hundred years of music vocabulary and palette that I have at me. So um, I'll throw up all sorts of different music, whether it's, you know, Bernard Herrmann or The Clash or Nina Simone and just see like, what does this feel like against this movie? And is there anything to draw from there? So music marries very much more easily to picture than you might, might think. Right. And almost any music that you put up against picture will alter how you receive that image. Right. And so by putting up the unexpected, I can start to see places to connect that aren't necessarily the obvious ones, but still work. Um, if you watch it just with no audio at all, you'll see places to connect, but some of them are really obvious, you know, like, change a scene or yeah. someone killed or whatever very clear actions as opposed to something more subtle and interesting not that you're going to ignore the major turning points but yeah just finding deeper ways to engage and, and you mentioned that uh, the album is coming out on fire so that's a different listening experience just listening to it without watching the film um so did you have that in mind when you were composing the music and putting the, putting this together or was it a, a kind of an afterthought it's uh, it's both a pre-thought and an afterthought. Uh, <laughs> usually when I'm composing something, I like to play around with the ideas as works in progress. And I do a million small shows around Austin where, you know, the audience knows me, I know the audience and the pressure is low. So right. I can right. throw a chart in front of the band that's an, a very raw idea and try it and see if it connects with the audience, see if it connects with the band, if it brings us somewhere interesting. And so I do that with a lot of my work, right? Uh, I mean, obviously this year I haven't so much, but in, okay. in the typical year, I use live shows to develop new material. Uh, so in that case, before any audience saw it with picture, they heard some of that music just as instrumental music. Uh, but then when I did the full score, uh, I wasn't planning on making an album and I wasn't thinking about a future audience who would be listening to this without picture. Right. Um, 
I think it's a little easier to go from a silent film to a uh, pure listening experience than from a contemporary feature film score for the simple reason that the music does a lot more work. It does a lot more of the lifting. Um, you know, the, the, you know there, there's so much more room in, in what the audio does in a silent film that there's just more, it translates to no image more quickly. Right, right. So my understanding is that your soundtrack premiered with the film a few years back, like 2017 or so. Did you, in that interim period, did you watch the reactions of the audience and gauge how things were working and make any changes or anything? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think of live performance and recorded music as two different art forms in a way. And this is sort of a hybrid meeting in the middle. Yep. Um, theater and film, you know, scripted performance with actors that is live scripted performance with actors that is a recorded medium, two different art forms. In music, we don't split them up as cleanly, uh, but I think of them, try to think of them that way at least. Uh, uh, you know, because we were working with a, an image that doesn't change and doesn't respond to the audience, it's sort of yeah. splitting the difference uh, a little bit between those two approaches. Okay. And what's your, what, how, how does, the film itself is, a, is, a, is kind of a strange beast in its own right. <laughs> so, yes. Because it's like a whodunit, but you don't know who done it. I guess. I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> What's up? Uh, oh, keep going. Yeah. So I just wonder how that affected your uh, attitude towards making the music. Yeah. It's. I mean, what, what's there are a couple of there are a lot of disadvantages to working with a silent film, and there's some advantages. Right. Uh, right. One of the big advantages is I get to collaborate with Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> That's even pretty cool. He's <laughs> long since passed. And so, uh, you know, watching and thinking about what, what he, what was the structure and the flow and the pacing and what was he looking at? What was he intending with this? And what would he want me to make? Right. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, if I'm working with Rick Linkletter, he, he gets to decide whether the music is finished or not. He right. gets to decide whether this music is right for this scene. Well, Alfred has nothing to say over whether I put this music to this scene or not. I get to decide. And, you know, I love working both ways. There's a weight off when, you know, Rick is the, the final arbiter and the, and the person who's looking at the big picture. In this case, there, I have a greater creative responsibility, which is both, you know, liberating and, uh, 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 but also a heavier at the same time. Right, right, right. So the actual sessions that created the music, um, what were they? Uh, there's strings, there's also, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, uh, work with piano. So was, is it mostly you playing things or are you kind of just overseeing? How, how does that work? Uh, so, uh, it's a, it's a hybrid. There, this, I don't play any of the strings, uh, and there's a live drummer combined with program drums. Right. And I do play some drums myself, but uh, for the ensemble, in this case, uh, it's a drummer, Jerry Mickey Brock, who has a very personal style and approach. Um, and the, the score was intended for him to be a part of it. Um, the... You know, I grew up playing piano, and for most of my life, that was the instrument I used on stage. And its parameters are so crystal clear. You know, you get these 88 keys, and, you know, every piano sounds different, but they all sound like a piano. Right. Uh, but, you know, for the last 20 years or so, I've been doing a lot of mi music making and recording and scoring in, in the computer. And its parameters are the opposite of the piano, yeah. where, you know, I take the same MIDI information, I can make it, you know, 30 oh different God. instruments in, in, in the blink of an eye, and yeah. um, some of which uh, were intended to be keyboard instruments, a synthesizer sound or something like that, and others that are 
imitations and others that are mutations of imitations. Right. Uh, you can do something with, I don't know, you know, uh, a, an oboe, you can take it down four octaves and it doesn't sound like an oboe anymore, but it, 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 at its core is this organic sound. Yeah. Uh, so I try to use the computer sounds to, to do what a computer does best and that what you cannot do with a live ensemble and have the live ensemble do what it does best and then merge the two. Right, right. So you had to break down the entire score, which I assume is about 90 minutes long, to an album that's 10 tracks long <laughs> and about 38 minutes. So how, how, what kind of process did you go through to decide what stayed and what went? Yeah, that, that goes back to your earlier question of like, what did we intend to be heard uh, uh, without picture? Mm -hmm. So looking over the score, there are certain places, you know, like arias in an opera, where they really work as standalone concert pieces. And, and the way that the, the recit, you know, who's going to perform that at a chamber music concert? It's, it's not, not quite filler, but it musically, funk, it's a little bit of a filler. Um, it is out of, out of context, not something that's particularly compelling. So really, we're looking for the, the equivalent of arias, the, the high emotional high points and peaks, the action peaks, the places where central themes become the most clear and the most powerful, um, and also a balance. You know, we didn't want all crazy weird sounds, but we wanted plenty of those. Yeah. Uh, so going through and picking things that uh, created a balanced album that shifted between moods, but still felt like of a piece. Right, right. I would say one, one of the tracks that stands out is Keep Your Handcuffs Hidden, because it builds up to this massive distortion and kind of noisy thing. Yeah. How, how did you put that together? Oh, uh, okay. So, <laughs> now I to, we, we, I'm pretty sure I know which one you're talking about, but we did change some of the, we had very working titles for a little while. Right, right, uh, right. But th the, we had done a TV score where we were playing around a lot in layers of distortion. Um, and I had some distortion software and uh, tools that I was really interested in. Right. Uh, and, you know, in a controlled environment like a computer, you can go pretty wild with the distortion without uh, blowing stuff up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I really like high contrast. Um, and something that's beautiful to me sounds more beautiful after you've heard this chaos and this intense noise. Right. And so putting them against each other amplifies the experience. Um, so I try to go maximum noise and, you know, distortion comes in so many different flavors. Uh, you know, I was talking to uh, some folks who, who donate a lot to the music conservatory here. And I said, you know, a contemporary composer needs a whole semester in distortion alone. I mean, it's such a complex world and any person who plays in bands for years is gonna have a basic understanding of the different, you know, whether it's a big muff or a rat pedal or the different styles of distortion that really define certain eras of time, mm -hmm. uh, bit reduction and all these other things that took over in computer music or, uh, so really exploring the wide palette of distortion is something that's fun and interesting to, to me and something that, uh, you know, you, you, especially in earlier, some film composition where they would just put distorted guitar and the composer wouldn't necessarily know the difference. And, uh, and you know, but it, the, the, the signal chain on Jimi Hendrix gear and Metallica's gear is radically different. So if it just says electric guitar and distortion, 
you don't really know what you're getting unless you get very, very specific. Yeah. So yeah. I like doing a deep dive into distortion nerddom. <laughs> so I assume you're kind of, at least in some kind of semi lockdown mode. Um, has this given you a chance to work on something new? What are you work? What's, what's your next project that you're thinking about? Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, compartmentalized. I'm having a great time and doing ton of work and making a lot of music. Cool. Um, we've got a couple projects. MXTX is this uh, group collaborative project we're working on. It's half uh, DJs, producers, and composers from Mexico uh -huh. and half from Texas. And <laughs> about 40 folks making a big, huge sample library, and then 13 of us making an album. And then eventually it'll premiere in Mexico City and Austin and then out in the desert in Marfa, Texas. Okay. So uh, one we're working on. Then we got an insect project that we're diving in on, which is cello, percussion, and keys, working with entomologists and studying insect sounds and turning that into a <laughs> soundscape. <laughs> so. Puts a whole new uh, uh, slant on the beetles, I guess. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> And you mentioned uh, Richard Linklater. Uh, are you doing anything movie, you know, on, on that level? Uh, yeah, I've done, we've got, well, most of the, any of the Linklater stuff that's in process is usually on an NDA uh, situation. So we right, don't right, right. really talk about that stuff. Um, but it actually has been a very uh, full f year in terms of film and TV. We just wrapped up a BBC comedy series that I scored, um, wrapped up a, another film a couple weeks ago, and this week I think we're going to finish another film. So it's quite a bit of film and TV scoring go, uh, going on, and and um, and Rick and I have been talking about some projects. So cool. And yeah, with all this music making, do you get a chance to listen to much music? Yeah, I I I do. Uh, I try to make a habit of it when we have, uh, when we're not working, everybody working from home who normally works in my studio on a normal morning, we try to have a certain time in the morning where we all gather and listen to something and each person takes turns bringing uh, something. So we'll, we'll there, there's usually at least something daily where <laughs> there's some focused listening going on. Anything you can throw out to us to recommend, check out? Hmm. Um, I've been really enjoying, and I'm, I would butcher her name, but the composer who did Chernobyl and the Joker, Icelandic composer, she's amazing. Okay. Uh, I've been... I'll look it up. I've been, yeah. <laughs> um, Wu Jinglu and um, Liu Tianhua, uh, two, one is a... Uh, Kuchin, compo uh, performer, player from China, and then uh, Liu Tianhua is a Chinese 20th century composer. Um, so been doing some deep dives into the, right. I've been doing it on and off for a while into Chinese music and studying that. Right. So. And would you like to work on any other Hitchcock films? Yeah, I mean, he did at least one or two other silent films that I haven't touched yet. So, okay. <laughs> I'm all and, for he, it. and he can't stop you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, the Charlie Chaplin estate is is a uh, is more protective, right? Uh, where because he wrote scores for his films. Sure. So if you show City Lights, they really it's maybe evolving or changing, but they've always really wanted you to do Charlie Chaplin's score for City Lights. And sure, sure. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Since the, there was a clear artistic intention behind that, and so yeah. That, yeah. that is the one that's the most tightly controlled that I know. Cool. All righty. Well, thank you very much for taking time to talk to me. Good to hear oh, things are happening in Texas, and in Austin especially. <laughs> I'd love to get back here at yeah. some point. It's a great Well, time. come on and visit when this is all over. I plan to. <laughs> all right. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.